So this evening, I get to start by talking about my specialty field, astronomy, astrophysics. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an enjoyable field, but it's one of those areas of, of science where the secularists have said, well, the science uh, proves the Big Bang billions of years and disproves Genesis. Uh, I beg to differ on that. And I want to show you that really when you understand the basics of astronomy, they reveal biblical creation. The secrets of the cosmos confirm the Bible. There are five secrets I'm going to cover this evening. I think it's helpful for us all to know just a little bit about the basics of science in different areas. And we're going to see that when, when the Bible touches on astronomy, it's right. And we're going to see that in five areas. We're going to see that when the Bible speaks about the glory of God being revealed in creation, that's certainly true. And we're going to see that when the Bible touches on uh, what we might call the basics of astronomy, things you'd learn in a freshman-level astronomy class, the Bible's exactly right about that. When the Bible touches on the issue of the age of the universe, it's right. And we're going to see how the science uh, lines up with that. When the Bible addresses the uniqueness of Earth, uh, we're going to see that it's right. We're going to see that the science confirms that. And then we'll talk a little bit about the distant starlight issue, and we're going to see the Bible's right about that as well. So let's dive right in. The Bible does speak about God's glory being revealed in the heavens, and it's right about that. So, for example, in Psalm 19.1, the, the text says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. And indeed they do, and there's a number of ways in which they do that. I'm going to argue that the size and the beauty of the cosmos are consistent with the mind of God and not just a, sort of an explosion of space that happened billions of years ago. And you don't really have to be an astrophysicist to appreciate the beauty of the universe. It's, uh, it's stunningly beautiful. You can go out on a clear night and look up and see the Milky Way, and it's just amazing. And, and what a privilege that we live in a time where we have a spacecraft like Hubble and now the James Webb Space Telescope that can peer out into incredible distances, and it's just unimaginably beautiful. And it speaks to God's magnificence and His glory. So the beauty of the universe declares God's glory. The size of the universe is something that is a little difficult to convey. And I dare say, no human being really grasps it. We can, the best I can do is compare some things to other things and kind of give you a feel for the magnificent size of the universe that God created. And it certainly speaks to his glory and his power as he spoke all of these things into existence. So we'll start with the moon. The moon is about 240,000 miles away from the earth. So if it looks small, it's because it's far away. It's about the same size as the United States. If you were to put the United States up at the same distance as the moon, it would cover about the same area, just to give you a feel for it. Uh, and yet you can cover it up with your finger because it's 240,000 miles away. And that distance is a distance that we can kind of wrap our minds around because some of you, if you have a really good vehicle, it might have 240,000 miles on it. So you could have driven potentially to the moon, although probably not back, right? <laughs> So that g we can kind of wrap our heads around that. But that's the nearest major celestial object. Okay, this is our next door neighbor. And once we get to anything beyond the moon, it's going to become very quickly incomprehensible how, how the distances to these things uh, measure out. This is a mosaic image of the moon. It's taken a bunch of high-resolution images and stitched them together. So that's why it, it, it never looks exactly like that to the eye because of the you can see the stitching in some places. But uh, I love showing people the moon in a, tele in a backyard telescope. I got a pretty decent one. And when you, when, when you look at the moon, it's amazing. It, you, can, you can zoom in on it. You see these amazing craters, especially what's in the first quarter phase or third quarter where it's illuminated right down the middle and you can see all the shadows of the craters and such. It's glorious. And some people, you know, the first reaction is, wow. And then the second reaction that some people say is, can you see the flag? that the astronauts <laughs> on the moon. Uh, no, you can't see the flag. Um, this is the size of the United States. And granted, we can zoom in quite a bit. You can zoom in and see features that are a few miles across, no problem. But the flag is, you know, it's like that big. So, But the interesting thing is we have spacecraft that we have at least, we, there's one spacecraft that was orbiting the moon and taking high resolution images of the surface in such high detail, we can actually see where the astronauts landed. And I'm going to show you one of these. This is... Uh, this is absolutely real. This is the uh, Mare Tranquilitatis, the sea, the sea of Tranquility. This is where the Apollo 11 astronauts landed. And we have such good quality photos, we can actually see the lower section of the lunar module that's still there. Remember when they launched, they left the bottom portion of the spacecraft, that spider-like looking structure, the uh, lunar excavation module. They left the lower portion of it to save fuel. So it's still there. And you can see it there along with these uh, 
th you see that little streak there off over on the, uh, on the right side there? That's the footprints of the astronauts as they walked over to that crater and back. So 50-year-old footprints, that's kind of neat. And uh, the moon doesn't have any atmosphere to speak of. It doesn't have any weather on it. So, and it, j it just got a layer, fine layer of dust on the surface, and so footprints stay there for a very long time. There's no maid service, so they're not going away for a, for a very long time. And there's some scientific equipment that they left on the moon as well. There is a, um, one of them is a reflector that's uh, specially designed to reflect back light exactly the way that it, that it came from. And uh, people have often bounced lasers off of that to and timed it, and sure enough, three seconds later, they get a response, because that's how long it takes light to get there and back. And so it, it's a kind of a proof that, we, yes, in fact, we have been there. We left equipment on the moon. So it's pretty neat. So there you go. So here's the, the scale of the cosmos really is as amazing as its beauty. So here's the, the moon from a, this is the first quarter phase where it's illuminated on the right side by the sun. And so you can see the, the shadows of the craters. It's really fun to look at the moon in this phase because uh, uh, your brain is immediately able to figure out that it's a sphere. It's just so cool because of the, the way the light uh, interfaces with the shadows of the craters. Your brain it figures out immediately that it's a sphere, and it's it's so beautiful. It's a little hard, maybe maybe you can't see that here, but in the telescope it's obvious. It's just obvious, and it's not only a testimony to how beautiful the moon is, but how amazing the human brain is that God designed. That I mean, think of the calculation that it has to do to figure out the shape of that based on a two-dimensional image, and yet based on the way the light and shadow work, your brain just immediately figures out it's a sphere. It's incredible. There's the moon compared to the size of the Earth. So the moon's about a fourth the size of the Earth. The Earth is pretty big. If you've ever driven through Kansas, you know the Earth is pretty big. It really is. There's a lot of space on it. And uh, you think, well, we got a pretty big planet, and we do. And wh what a privilege that we live in a time where we can see the Earth from above. We've sent astronauts up there. A friend of mine is actually an astronaut. He just retired, actually, but he's spent more time in space than almost anybody. And uh, we, what he does in his, his, in his uh, spare time, they don't have a lot of spare time on the space station, but when they do, there's a, there's a bubble in the lower section where they can, it's kind of a circular window, and he goes and he gets his camera and he just takes pictures, and, and it's amazing. And uh, we did a presentation together one time, and to save time, uh, we put it on my computer, and I still have his PowerPoint. I said, Jeff, I'm keeping your PowerPoint because uh, it's beautiful. And what a privilege that we can see the Earth from space, something that our ancestors only could have imagined. And you think, well, we got a pretty big planet, and we do until you compare it to Saturn, for example. Saturn's about nine Earths across. So that's a, that's a bit humbling when you, <laughs> you think, okay, I and everyone I know uh, we live on that little thing, and uh, there's a lot bigger planets in our solar system. Four planets are bigger than Earth in our own solar system. So there's Saturn. That those rings, of course, make it as just especially pretty. And those are trillions of tiny little moonlets that orbit around Saturn's equator. And, uh, and the Lord tilted that planet so we could see the rings. Otherwise, you wouldn't know they were there. But it's uh, just a delight to see that. And what a lesson in perspective, because that's the other object that people love to see in a telescope. And it is amazing. It's one thing to see a picture of it. It's, it's, it's different to see it with your own eyes. It really is. And it's magnificent. And you can, your brain again figures out, oh yeah, that's, that's three-dimensional. That's got a ring going around it from the geometry there. And, uh, but it's small in the telescope. It looks like it's about that big. You just want to grab it and stick it in your pocket and take it home with you. But you can't because it's nine Earths across. Uh, but it looks small because it's a billion miles away. A billion miles away. Now, that now we're, getting, we're getting somewhere, okay? None of you have a car with a billion miles on it. Saturn might seem big until we compare it to the sun. The sun's about 100 Earths across, across the diameter. Amazing. And it, again, you can cover it up with your finger because it's 93 million miles away. And that, again, is a distance that is just hard to comprehend. How, how long would it take to drive 93 million miles? Uh, over 150 years. It just gives you kind of a feel for it. And that's without stopping for bathroom breaks and things like that. So it just gives you a feel for the, that kind of distance. Pretty amazing. So the sun is kind of a stable hydrogen bomb. It's fusing hydrogen into helium in the core, and that, that releases energy. And it, in fact, the sun releases more energy in one second than a billion major cities on Earth could use in an entire year. God has unlimited power. And this is just one of the objects that he created. The sun is a star in the sense that those little points of light you see in the night sky, those are the same type of object as the sun. 
and uh, in terms of fusing hydrogen into helium, releasing energy. And uh, the sun is what we call a main sequence star. Main sequence means it obeys a rule where if, if you know the mass of the star, that kind of determines all of its other properties. It determines its size, its color, its luminosity, uh, the surface temperature, and so on. The sun obeys that rule, and most stars do. Uh, main sequence stars that are less massive than the sun are smaller and redder. We call these red dwarfs. They're everywhere. There are lots of red dwarfs in the universe. The sun's bigger than most stars. But there are stars that are bigger than the sun, quite a bit bigger. Uh, Mintaka, for example, one of the stars of Orion's belt that you see in the winter sky. It's a blue supergiant, and it's quite a bit bigger than the sun. And keep in mind, the sun's 100 times the size of the Earth. So just think about how big that is. And then there are stars bigger than Mintaka, though, like uh, Canopus, for example, which you cannot see from New York. But if you go to some of the southern states in February, it'll be kind of a bright star below the, uh, just above the, uh, the southern horizon that time of year. Uh, white supergiant, really a uh, very um, beautiful star. There are stars even bigger than Canopus, though, like uh, Antares, for example. So it dwarfs our sun. I mean, our, our Antares is about 600 suns across. So it just it's just amazing how large these things get. And we think this is close to, there are stars that are a little bigger than Antares, but there is a limit. And uh, But it's just it's just amazing to think of the, the power that inv was involved when God spoke all that mass into existence. So some stars are kind of like the sun. They're kind of by themselves. Some have planets and so on. But some stars come in clusters. This is where you have a bunch of stars in a relatively small region of space, 50 light years across, where a light year is about 6 trillion miles. And so it's, you know, it's, it's compact for, uh, compared to the stars in, in the disk of our galaxy. But this is called a globular star cluster. I love these things. They are so beautiful. They... Um, there's a few hundred of them that are within range of a, a backyard telescope, and all but one of them are in the summer sky. There's one that's in the, win in the winter sky. And uh, they're just fun to look at. We think there's probably about 100,000 stars in a typical globular cluster. Amazing. And the Bible says God calls them all by their names. God has a name for each one of those stars, a purpose for it, therefore. And uh, we can't even, you know, we, we can only estimate that, that number. We can't, it's not like anybody's counted. We can just kind of... We can count an area and then extrapolate and so on. So these are so fun to look at. And there's, there's no substitute for seeing it with your own eyes. I mean, pictures are pretty. Seeing it with your own eyes is just an experience. It is really wonderful. Some of my favorite objects in the universe are not stars at all, though. They are what are called nebulae. That's the plural, nebula. That's Latin. It means cloud. And it looks like a cloud like in, in Earth's sky, but it's not. It's a cloud of hydrogen gas. That's the same stuff that stars are made of, that lightest element, hydrogen, a little bit of helium. And uh, whereas stars are gas that's been compressed into a sphere by gravity. Yes, gas has gravity. You get enough of it, it'll, it'll stay a sphere. Um, the nebula is spread out over a vast region of space. So it's, 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 it's mostly, a nebula is mostly empty space. There's only a few atoms per cubic meter. But if there's stars nearby, they'll heat up that gas and cause it to glow, and you get the most wonderful colors in these things. They're just delightful artwork of God, and on a canvas of unimaginable size. It's really pretty amazing. And sometimes you'll get a star cluster next to the nebula, as you have here. So there's a you can see the star cluster in the lower right there. And uh, the nebula, this is part of the what's called the Tarantula Nebula, in a nearby um, the one of the Magellanic Clouds. Um, some nebulae are relatively small. These are called planetary nebula. This is where a... It has nothing to do with planets. It's just um, this is where you have a star that's making the nebula. The star is ejecting gas, and it forms kind of a, a cocoon around itself. So, uh, and a lot of these planetary nebula have or have a sort of two lobes. We think that there's material orbiting the disk, uh, orbiting the kind of the equator of the star, and so it, get, it channels the energy out the north and south poles the, in terms of the mass flow. So uh, they're beautiful. They're beautiful to look at. Uh, there's some other planetary nebula. Some planetary nebulae are round. And the first one I learned how to find in a backyard telescope is that one. It's the Ring Nebula. And it's so cool to see the Ring Nebula. It's not too far away from the star Vega, which is visible in uh, summer skies. And that one is visible from New York. That's not a problem. And by the way, the, the book um, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, I'll mention that again later. It'll show you how to find all these things if you're interested. In, because a lot of these you can see with a backyard telescope. Not all of them, but this one you certainly can. And... Um, it, it will look kind of like a gray version of that because when you're using your night vision, you're using primarily the rods and your eyes, which are, which are not color sensitive. 
but they can go, they can see fainter things. So just imagine a gray version of this, and it, it's lovely to see. And strange, because it's, it's a smoke ring, and you're expecting it to expand out, and it is expanding out. It's just enormous, and so you can't see it. You know, it takes centuries to see it getting any bigger, so we don't really see that. So again, the star that produced it has collapsed in on itself. You can see it in the middle there. That's a little white dwarf star. It's no longer fusing hydrogen. It's collapsed in on itself to something that's considerably smaller. All of these things we've looked at, all of these moons and planets and stars and star clusters and nebulae are part of a much larger structure called a galaxy. Now, so we live in a structure like this, about two-thirds of the way out in terms of where our solar system is. So what you're seeing there is the combined light of about 100 billion stars. And so we live in a structure like this, and there are other galaxies out there. In the early 20th century, most astronomers thought there was just our galaxy, that our galaxy was the entire universe. Now, they could see other structures like that, but they thought those were small and inside our galaxy. They didn't realize that those were other galaxies with 100 billion stars each. And we estimate there's at least 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe. So one for each star on our own. So it's really magnificent. All kinds of galaxies out there in space. Galaxies of tremendous beauty. There are galaxies of tremendous ugliness. Yeah, there are a few. There are galaxies with large mysterious arrows next to them. You'll see it in all the textbooks. <laughs> there are galaxies that have rings of stars surrounding them. That's kind of neat, ring galaxies. There are galaxies that look like flying saucers. That's the Sombrero Galaxy. And I remember the first time I saw that, because you can see that in a small telescope. You can see that dark dust lane there. And it's just weird. There's just nothing like it. It's just so cool. But w again, combined light of 100 billion stars. Think about that, 100 billion suns. Think about that energy. God has unlimited power. Galaxies in the process of collision, that's pretty neat. Uh, it'd be harmless. The stars will pass by each other because the distance between stars is enormous compared to the size of, of a star. In fact, if you take our entire solar system all the way out to Neptune and put it in a, in a cube, so this represents kind of the orbit of Neptune, so there's all the sun and all the planets. How many cubes to the next star? 4,278. There's a lot of empty space out there. Uh, the distances are unimaginable. They really are. So we go even deeper into space, we find galaxies come in clusters. This is not a cluster of stars, this is a cluster of galaxies. Each one of those fuzzy little things you see there is a galaxy with maybe 100 billion stars each. Some, some less, some more. Some galaxies have a trillion stars. So just incredible. Go out even deeper into space, you find galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. Until recently, this is about as far out as we could look. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And you just see galaxies beyond limit. And we can go even deeper now with the James Webb Space Telescope. So I need to update this, actually, because we can go out even deeper into space. And the secularists believe that you're looking kind of sort of back in time as you look out into space because of the time it takes for the light to get here. That's not exactly true, but in any case, um, they were expecting that when the James Webb Telescope would peer out, it would reach the distance whereby you don't find galaxies anymore because they hadn't formed yet in the Big Bang view. Uh, back in January, I made some predictions based on biblical creation as to what I expected the James Webb Telescope to see. And I predicted that it would continue to find galaxies at distances beyond what the secularists were expecting. They kind of figured they'd stop at Redshift 14. I predicted they will continue to be on that, and you'll find fully formed, fully designed galaxies. The secularists thinking, well, the early galaxies will look kind of clumpy because they're just starting to form. I said, nope, they're going to be mature, fully designed galaxies because God finished his work of creation uh, by the sixth day and called it very good. So I think they're all, they're all fully formed. And I predicted that they would have heavy elements in them too. Um, well, that was back in January. The James Webb Space Telescope in July became operational and it took some images of very distant galaxies. Guess who was right? It wasn't the secularists. They were wrong. You see, if you base your thinking on scripture, you can make predictions, scientific predictions that are verified. And uh, there's, there's an ar article on that. There's two articles now on the website. There's one about my predictions. That was, I think, January 21st. You go back and look on the website, you can read that. And then more recently, I published a, another article showing what James Webb actually found. And it, uh, it confirms biblical creation. The galaxies beyond imagination at distances that you can't comprehend. Nobody can. It's beyond human minds. We can put numbers with it. We can use scientific notation, but we can't really grasp it. 
And think of all that, spoken into existence by God. Each one of those little specks you see there is a galaxy with perhaps 100 billion stars each. Spoken into existence by God. He said, let there be light. Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. And there, and there they were. They leapt into existence. And I love the way the Bible describes the creation of all these hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each. It's summed up in this little phrase, he made the stars also. Isn't that neat? If you think about it, God spent five of the six creation days working the earth, making it right for life. He took one day, day four, that first Wednesday, and made everything else, almost as an afterthought. You know what would go really good with this earth? How about 100 billion galaxies? And I've had um, secularists say, well, why would he, you know, why would he make all that big universe, you know, if it's just, if, it's, if we're just, you know, it's just us? And Well, first of all, it's not, it's not really about you. It's about God and his glory. Secondly, if he, if he made it that big to impress me, he succeeded. I'm impressed. I hope you are too. The universe is not an accident. It is amazingly well-designed and beautiful and big beyond imagination. So pretty amazing. So the universe does declare God's glory. And the more you know about it, the more you can see that. What about the basics of astronomy? Things you'd learn in, a, in any freshman-level astronomy class, whether secular or Christian. Uh, the Bible does touch on astronomy. It does. It's not an astronomy textbook. People you know, say, well, yeah, the Bible, it's not an astronomy textbook. That's true. Astronomy textbooks change every few years when we learn we got some things wrong. We have to update them. God will never have to update the Bible. He got it right the first time. When it touches on astronomy, it's right. And there are certain things the Bible does teach about the universe. And the interesting thing about th these facts that I'm going to show you, when, they, when these were first presented in the Bible, they did not align with the secular science of the day. Secular scientists would have said, well, the Bible's wrong about that. Today, we'd have to agree the Bible got it right. For example, the spherical nature of the world. The Bible uh, describes Earth's shape as being, well, circular in Isaiah 40, 22, and you might think, well, that could be a kind of a flat disk, but Job 26, 10 indicates it's a sphere that God, it says God inscribes a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. Now, that boundary is what astronomers call the terminator, and that's where light, light stops or terminates. And uh, the only shape that produces a circular terminator at all times is a sphere. And so Job knew that the world was round, which is interesting because Job is around 2000 BC. We think that's when he lived and when that book was written. Um, and, but the interesting thing is if you consult most astronomy textbooks, they will credit usually a Pythagoras with being the first person to assert that the earth is round. Uh, we don't know if he had any good arguments for that or if he just kind of believed it, but Aristotle is usually considered the first to demonstrate that the Earth is round, and it is easy to do that. There's different experiments you can do. Uh, I, th I believe this November there's going to be a lunar eclipse where Earth's shadow will fall on the moon, and you can confirm that it, you know, it casts a circular uh, disk. But Pythagoras is 500s B.C., Aristotle's 300s B.C., Isaiah's 700 B.C., so it was before Pythagoras and Aristotle. Uh, Job, again, 2000 B.C., as far as I can tell, everybody other than believers in God at 2000 B.C. believed in a flat earth. But uh, Job knew better. It's almost as if he had some kind of divine insight into this issue. Isn't that interesting? And, of course, he did. Uh, by the way, the idea that Christopher Columbus was out to prove the world was round is a myth. He, people already, educated people already knew the world was round at the time of Columbus. He just thought it would be faster to go that way because he didn't know about the Americas. And, frankly, he was using a misestimation of the Earth's size. Uh, but I'm glad he made the trip. The uh, earth is suspended in space. The Bible says God hangs the earth on nothing. It's a beautiful poetic description of the nature of gravity. And, of course, we have pictures today that confirm that God hangs the earth on nothing. That might have been hard to believe when it was first written. Again, Job, 2000 B.C. Uh, most cultures at that time believed the earth was flat, floated in water, or was somehow supported by something beneath it. And what was beneath that is hard to say. But in any case... That might have been easier to believe, right? I mean, the, again, even the early Greeks taught that the earth floated in water. And that, that is easier to picture because we've seen things that are, we understand buoyancy. We've seen things that float in water. We get that. Uh, but can you hang something on nothing? No, but God can and did. And today we have pictures confirming that. So it's pretty neat that, again, long before the, se the secularists of the day figured it out, God did know about the nature of the earth its shape, and its suspension in space. The Bible indicates that God stretched out the heavens as a curtain, spread them out as a tent to dwell in, Isaiah 40, 22. Uh, very interesting. So apparently the universe is bigger than when God first created it. He stretched it out. 
And uh, that, again, might have been hard to believe when it was written because up until the 1500s, astronomers generally believed that the universe was eternal and unchanging. They believed that um, the idea that it could be getting bigger, nah. And it's certainly not obvious, right? You go outside tonight and look up if it's clear. Uh, you, the stars look about the same size, same distance as they did the previous night, right? It doesn't look like the universe is getting bigger. But in the 1920s, astronomers Edwin Hubble and others, um, by measuring what we call redshifts of galaxies, they realized that galaxies are kind of all moving away from each other as if the entire universe is being stretched out or expanded. How about that? And it, was, uh, it took a little while for that to catch on and for secularists to agree that, yep, the universe is being expanded. But again, the Bible taught that thousands of years earlier. And the interesting thing about that is in order to detect the expansion of the universe, because it's rather slow, you can't detect it on the scale of like our solar system. It's only kind of between the galaxies that it's really being stretched out in a measurable way. In order to detect that scientifically, you'd, you'd need modern instrumentation. You'd need, teles you'd need at least a telescope, a good telescope, and you'd need what we call a spectroscope. And those are modern inventions. The telescope wasn't inv invented until 1608. The spectroscope was later. So uh, how did Isaiah know about that? Well, he had access to the God who spoke the universe into existence. So, of course, he knew about that. Uh, and, and then, of course, the question then people ask is, well, does this indicate a Big Bang? Because if the galaxies are all sort of moving away from each other and you run it back in time, if the universe is getting bigger, back in time, go back billions of years, does it go back to a point? Uh, no. Uh, just because something's getting bigger does not mean it exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago. Some of you are getting bigger. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence 13.8 <laughs> billion years ago, okay? We've got to be careful about unwarranted extrapolations. It just means the universe is bigger than when it was first created. God created the universe with size about 6,000 years ago, according to Scripture, and he stretched it out a bit since then. Uh, it is neological extrapolation to go back beyond that, beyond the starting point. Uh, some people say, but does this at least confirm? Isn't this at least a successful prediction of the Big Bang? Uh, didn't the Big Bang predict that we'd find uh, galaxies moving away from each other, and there they are? No, because the, uh, this expansion was discovered in the 1920s. The Big Bang, the idea of the universe coming from a point, was invented in 1931 as an explanation for this. Okay? They already knew the universe was expanding, and Lemaitre thought, well, you know, if we, if we keep going back uh, to the beginning, we assume that God didn't create it in a supernatural way. He, he was a methodological naturalist. He did believe in God, but he believed that God basically doesn't do anything. So um, he, you run it back, and he said, well, it must have started from a point. But he already knew about expansion. It wasn't a prediction of the Big Bang. And it doesn't indicate a Big Bang. It just means the universe is bigger than when God first created it. And that's, again, something that the Bible apparently teaches. Conservation of energy and mass. This one's a little more abstract, but these are well understood and studied principles in, uh, in physics. Um, we'd expect that. So, so energy is the ability to, it's either something in motion or the ability to produce motion. And then mass is kind of the amount of stuff that you have. And Einstein discovered that energy and mass really are the same thing. They're just measured in two different ways. All energy has mass, all mass has energy. And the, the conservation of energy, conservation means, you know, stays the same. And that, basically that means that mass can't be created or destroyed. Energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another. God allows us to do that, but he doesn't allow us to create energy or to destroy energy. <coughs> and so that's kind of interesting. We'd expect that, though, on the basis of scripture. Uh, no new energy is gonna come into existence because that would either mean that God is still creating, which we know he isn't in terms of creating ma new material, because God ended his work of creation by the seventh day, the Bible says in Genesis 2-2, or it would mean that something can come into existence apart from God, which cannot be because the Bible indicates in John 1-3 that all things are made by him. And without him, not anything was made that was made. Okay, and so no new stuff's gonna come into existence, Furthermore, we would expect stuff would not simply cease to exist because God upholds all things by the word of his power. Christ, in particular, upholds all things by the word of his power. And in him or by him, all things consist or hold together. So God maintains the existence of that which he created. He does allow it to change form. And that's good. That allows us to, you know, uh, use energy for useful work. And so we can make vehicles that go somewhere and so on and so forth. But we can't create or destroy energy. It only transforms from one kind uh, to another. 
uh, does this preclude a miracle? No, God can make an exception if he wants to, obviously. But this is the general trend. God's not making new stuff in terms of new physical stuff, and he's not, uh, he's not allowing what he made to cease to exist. Those two principles together are conservation of energy or conservation of mass. And it's difficult to pin down when these were discovered by scientific means. Usually James Joel is, d is credited with the discovery of conservation of energy. He'd done some experiments uh, colliding uh, uh, billiards and so on and found that uh, energy is always conserved. And that's, but that's 1800s. And so again, um, many, many centuries ahead of that, the Bible is speaking of these, these principles. These, these are biblical principles. And by the way, James Joel was a Bible believer. And, um, and when, when he writes about the discovery of conservation of energy, he pointed out, well, you know, actually this makes sense. To something of the effect of this makes sense because God isn't creating anymore. So of course we're not gonna have new energy. So he was motivated by scripture. And by the way, that was very common. Uh, modern secularists like to pretend that science comes out of a secular worldview. It does not. It comes out of a Christian worldview. And most of the founding fathers of the various disciplines of science were Christians. They expected to find orderliness in nature because they believed in an orderly creator who upholds his universe in a consistent way. So, countless numbers of stars. The Bible describes Abraham's descendants as an uncountable number, at least uncountable to human beings. God counts the number of stars and has a name for each one, but they're humanly uncountable. And one passage says that, which cannot be numbered for multitude. The stars, the, it, the Abraham's descendants would be uncountable, like the stars of heaven or like the sand which is upon the seashore, a number that's not humanly countable. And uh, Genesis 22, 17 is one such passage. And you say, well, yeah, 100 billion stars in our galaxy. But the interesting thing is that might have been harder to believe when it was first written because the number of stars you can see naked eye, somewhere between 3,000, and if you have superb vision, 10,000. And that's it. And that's a big number, but it's countable. You could count to 10,000. It would be tedious, but you could do it. Okay? But that, that was before 1608. What happened in 1608? A telescope was, was invented. And then by 1610, Galileo had made his own, and he, he did what no other person with a telescope had thought to do. He pointed it up. Before that, they thought, well, yeah, that'd be good for spying on your neighbor. Or, you know. He thought, hey, I want to see what the universe looks like up close. And he pointed it up, and he, that Milky Way, that cloudy band, oh, that's 100 billion stars. And you can't count to 100 billion in your lifetime. It's not possible. So the, the number of stars just in our galaxy is humanly uncountable. And that's one galaxy. We think there's at least 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So you multiply that out, that's a really big number. Big. Interesting. Might have been hard to believe when it was written. All of these w were. Because all of these, all of these principles were contrary to what most philosophers, scientists believed at the time that they were written. And... All those scholars, philosophers, are what we call wrong. The Bible was right. They were wrong. Have we learned the lesson of history? That's my question. In the past, whenever the experts of the day have disagreed with the Bible, the Bible has always turned out to be right, and the experts have egg on their face. They were wrong. The Bible was right. Have we learned that lesson? Some of us have. Some of us haven't. We, uh, it, it, there are areas, even today, where a secularist would, I mean, any, any secular astronomer is going to have to admit, yes, the Bible was right about the spherical nature of the earth, about it hanging in space, about conservation of energy, expansion of the universe, and somehow they got lucky on all those things. But we know the Bible's wrong about this, that, and the other. Those people have not learned a lesson of history. They haven't learned a lesson of history. And one such area where my secular colleagues say the Bible's wrong concerns the age of the universe. Because the Bible teaches that God created in six days. Those of you that were with us this morning, we saw that those have to be earth rotations. They're ordinary literal days. They're not poetic for long periods of time or anything like that. The text does not allow that. And we learned that uh, human beings are made on the sixth day. And we've only been around for you know, a few thousand years. Even, even evolutionists don't believe that human beings have been around you know, 4.5 billion years or anything like that. So the universe is a few thousand years old, according to a straightforward reading of the history in scripture, and there are many lines of evidence that confirm that. It's just you tend not to hear about them too much in the uh, secular system. Uh, so yes, God did create in six days, and most of the universe is made on day four. Secularists believe that the stars and galaxies e evolved long before the earth, billions of years before the earth. 
The Bible says the earth was here on day one. It's one of the first things God created. It was a ball of water. He hadn't organized it yet, but earth as a, as a globe, it existed. And then God made the other objects, the other objects in the universe on day four. So they're actually, the earth's actually three days older than any other planet. That's something to think about. And there is a lot of evidence in, in the universe of evidence of processes that even if we assumed the evolutionist standards of sort of uniform processes over time, it's inconsistent with the billions of years, like the internal heat of the giant planets. Jupiter actually gives off, it emits twice as much energy as it receives from the sun. So it gets one unit from the sun, gives away two. Every second, gets one unit, gives away two. It's kind of like the federal government. Take in one, spend away two, right? <laughs> and like the federal government, it can't do that forever uh, because eventually it runs out of heat. And in fact, if Jupiter were really 4.5 billion years old, as the secularists claim, it should have run out of heat a long time ago. Now, Jupiter's not hot, but my point is it's, it's warmer than it should be if it were billions of years old because it's still giving off more heat than it receives from the sun. And it's been doing that for 6,000 years, and that's not a problem. But if it were billions of years old, it should have run out of internal heat. It's kind of like a uh, potato that you take out of the microwave. You just nuked it, and you bring it out. You can feel the heat coming off of it, right? That's radiative transfer. You're getting some convection, too. But that, that's what happens. Objects that are warm, they give off energy. They radiate that heat into space. Now, if you came back two hours later, is your potato still going to be warm? Of course not. It's radiated all that energy away. It comes into equilibrium with its environment. Jupiter is like a potato that's still very warm, which means it didn't come out of the oven all that long ago. Now, it's a much bigger potato, so it can do that for a few thousand years, but it can't do it for billions of years. The problem's even worse for Neptune, which you see in the lower right there. Neptune, about four times the size of the Earth, so it's smaller than Jupiter. It gives off 2.6 to 2.7 times as much energy as it receives from the sun. It's been doing that for every second of every day of every year for 6,000 years, and it's still got enough energy left to continue to do that. But if it, get, it was billions of years old, it should have run out a long time ago. So that's the, what the secularists call the heat problem. I call it the heat feature. The magnetic field of the Earth is decaying. You might know the Earth has this magnetic field that allows your compass to work. It's also a design feature. It protects us from radiation from the sun that would be harmful, ionizing radiation. It deflects it like an invisible shield. Pretty neat. And uh, of course, if you've never seen the northern lights, when that magnetic field gets disturbed, that's how you get um, aurora. And they're quite beautiful and quite lovely. That magnetic field is caused by electrical current in the core, and electrical current decays with time. So basically, the battery that, that runs our magnetic field is, is decaying. And we've been able to measure that for the last, oh, last century and a half at least, almost two centuries, we've been able to measure that. And it is decaying. There's no doubt about that. It's weaker than it was 150 years ago, no doubt. And if you run it back in time, we think that during the flood year, we think that the magnetic field rapidly flipped um, there, because there was rapid te plate tectonics that would disrupt that current. But in terms of the strength, it's just been decaying uh, since creation. And if you run the equation backwards, the magnetic field would have been about 20 times stronger at creation. So your compass would work really well back at creation. And we'd have increased protection from cosmic radiation. That's a good thing because that cosmic radiation can cause things like cancer. It causes mutations. So there, there would have been less disease back at the beginning. We'd have had increased protection. That would have been kind of nice. But as far as we can tell, that's an exponential decay. And if you run it back even 60,000 years, it gets so strong. It's actually stronger than that of a neutron star, which would be enough to rip the atoms of your body apart. So you don't want that. And I'm talking 60,000 years, not millions. So there's no way the Earth could be millions of years old based on the decay of the magnetic field. Again, assuming the secular uh, uniformitarianist view, even being generous to our critics. And it's not just the Earth. Some of the other planets have magnetic fields, including Jupiter. Jupiter's today is already too strong. You, you wouldn't want to put a human being too close to Jupiter because that magnetic field could induce currents that would be lethal. So its, it's magnetic field is too strong. And um, well, how is that the case if it's billions of years old? Because magnetic fields do decay with time. Batteries run down. The bigger the battery, the longer it lasts. Remember those old D cells, which are rarely used anymore, but they lasted for a long time because they were big. Uh, so the Earth's kind of like a triple A, and it's still got the magnetic field. And that tells us it's not, uh, it's not that old. Jupiter's bigger, so it can maintain a magnetic field longer, but it's incredibly strong. It'd be, Jupiter's magnetic field would be bigger than the sun if you, could, if you could visually see it. So it's just impressive. Uh, the planets Uranus and Neptune. This is Uranus here. It's tilted on its side, so it, it rotates this way. It rolls around the sun. 
And uh, it has a magnetic field, and this was something that was unexpected to the secularists because they believe this planet's 4.5 billion years old. It's, about, it's only four times the size of the Earth, and it doesn't have a lot of material that would be uh, expected to produce magnetic fields. So they were expecting that the magnetic field that it initially had would be long gone since it's 4.5 billion years old. Uh, Dr. Russ Humphreys, who's a friend of mine, he's a, a physicist and a creationist like myself, he predicted the magnetic field of Uranus based on a 6,000-year decay. He did that back in 1984, and then the Voyager spacecraft flew past Uranus in 1986, measured the magnetic field, and Dr. Humphreys was right on. Secularists were way off. You see, if you want to get the right answer, start with the Bible. If you want to get the wrong answer, start with evolution. That's just, that's just how it works. So there you go. So there's the... In fact, you can even see aurora. That little spot you see on the bottom there, that's aurora borealis, right? That's uh, northern lights on another planet. Pretty neat. So that tells you it's got a fairly, fairly powerful magnetic field. And likewise with Neptune. Neptune's not tilted as much, but it does have a um, fairly strong magnetic field. And those were predicted, again, by Dr. Humphreys. The secularists have been scratching their heads. They say, well, there must be some mechanism to recharge the magnetic field. There's always a rescuing device, right? We talked about those last night, if you were here for that. Um, they say there's some kind of dynamo that recharges the magnetic field. There's just not good evidence for that. As far as we can tell, this is just evidence of the youth of these planets. They're not billions of years old. The recession of the moon. The moon is actually spiraling away from the Earth. Its, it's orbit's not a complete circle. It's a spiral that gets a little bigger every year by about an inch and a half. It's not very much. And so if you add that up over time, since creation, the moon has moved 750 feet away from the Earth. So it's not even one mile difference. So Adam could have also said the moon is 240,000 miles away. It's not even a one-mile difference. But that adds up quick if you go back billi billions of years. See, it's caused by tidal forces. The moon induces tides on the Earth, and they, uh, they pull on the moon. But since the Earth rotates faster than the moon, the tidal bulges get ahead of the moon, and that pulls forward on it. And when you pull forward on something in orbit, it moves out. That's a little counterintuitive. But the astronauts, when they want to go into a higher orbit, they thrust forward. And that kicks them out and gives them more energy. And so uh, if you run the equation backwards, and you have to do the math right because the rate changes. As the moon's closer to the Earth, the tidal bulges would be bigger, which means it'd move faster, and they'd get bigger and it'd move faster. And the Earth and the moon would be in the same place at 1.45 billion years in a hypothetical past. And you say, well, that's a, that's a, long, that's a long time, 1.4 billion, right? The problem is, in the secular view, the Earth and moon are supposed to be 4.5 billion years old, okay, and that is, 4.5 is larger than 1.4 for the, for the common core folks, okay, <laughs> yeah, so that's a problem. The, the maximum possible age of the moon based on recession is less than the secular estimated age of the Earth and moon, so that's a problem. Uh, comets are made up of icy material, and they, they get depleted every time they go around the sun. A comet gets smaller, it loses mass, a typical comet can last no more than about 100,000 years, and yet we still have comets. And the secularists say, well, there's an Oort cloud that produces new ones. That's a nice rescuing device, but there's no evidence for an Oort cloud. As far as we can tell, comets simply indicate the youth of the solar system. And it's not just the solar system. Galaxies, spiral galaxies, for example. Not all galaxies are spirals, but a lot of them are. And spiral galaxies rotate differentially, meaning the inner portions rotate faster. The inner portions don't like that. The outer portions are rotating slower in terms of how long it takes to make a lap. And so you'd expect that spiral structure would get tighter and tighter every year, wouldn't it? I've actually run some computer simulations based on the actual measured velocities of stars to see how long it takes a spiral galaxy to wrap up to where you can't see a spiral anymore. And it's, it's less than 100 million years. Now, these galaxies are supposed to be 10 billion years old. But based on the spiral wrapping, they can't be, they can't be anywhere close to that or they would be wrapped beyond recognition. They've, they've been wrapping for just, I think God made them already as spirals, and they've wrapped just a bit tighter in 6,000 years, and mainly near the core, which would be the tightest uh, part of the galaxy there. You might notice that the arms of that spiral galaxy have a bluish color to them. That's true. That's because they have a higher proportion of blue stars, and blue stars are an indication of the youth of the universe. Blue stars are the most massive and luminous stars. They're the brightest stars out there. They're not as common as red dwarfs, but they're easier to see because they're very, very bright. And they can't last billions of years because they use up their fuel so quickly. And by the way, nobody disputes that. The secularists also agree that blue stars can't, they can't last billions of years. And yet they're everywhere. We, we see them all over the, the galaxy. So the secularists say, well, the new blue stars must have formed. 
And so if you've ever, ever heard them say, well, here we see a, a star forming region, or this is a stellar nursery, let me clue you in. They're not seeing stars form there. No one has. No one has seen a star form. Gas in space tends to spread out. It doesn't tend to want to just come in and form a little sphere. Once you get the gas there, its gravity will hold it together. But getting it to that condition, I'm not convinced that that can be done, at least not by natural means. And so when they say this is a star-forming region, what they're really saying is there's lots of blue stars here. That's what, that's what they're seeing. There's lots of blue stars in this area, and therefore this can't be billions of years old, so they must have formed recently. That's what that means. It's interesting how, uh, how the media sometimes reports things. So, so the science with the age of the universe is consistent with the Bible. It's just you tend not to hear these kind of things in, uh, in most environments. What about the uniqueness of Earth? This is another area where the secular scientists say the Bible's wrong about this because the Bible indicates that Earth is, is very special in a number of ways. Uh, it's the place where God put the beings that he made in his own image. That's very special. That's a unique privilege. There's a lot of wonderful creatures in the, on the Earth and in the oceans and so on. We're made in God's image, though. That's awesome. That's awesome. This is the world where God became a man and died our death. He didn't do that for Mars or Venus. He did that for Earth and the human beings that inhabit it. Earth is special. It's designed to be inhabited. The Bible says as much in Isaiah 45, 18. God formed the world. He didn't make it to be a waste place. He formed it to be inhabited. And so the creatures that he made, and the earth, of course, has features that are designed for life, liquid water, and it's got the right temperature range and so on. It's tilted the right amount to cause seasons, but not, it's not tilted so much that seasons would become extreme and we'd, we'd be killed, nor is it, if it were not tilted, then there would be no seasons, but the temperate zones would be reduced, and so you, there'd, there'd be less land available to live on. Uh, the other planets and, and moons that God made, uh, the Earth's moon, it's magnificent. It's not formed to be inhabited. You can't live on the moon. There's no air. There's no water. There's no food. When the astronauts went to the moon, they had to bring a little bit of Earth with them to survive. They brought some air from the Earth. They brought some food from the Earth and so on, water. One of the astronauts who walked on the surface of the moon referred to it as a magnificent desolation. I think that's a wonderful name, uh, wonderful description because the moon has a beauty to it, but it's a desolate beauty. It's very grayscale. There's no color on the moon at all, and there's no life. Uh, Earth's neighbors, you got uh, Venus on the left, Mars on the right. Uh, Venus is closer to the sun, Mars is a little further away. These are our next door neighbors. And in the past, some secularists thought Venus might have all kinds of exciting exotic life forms on its surface, and maybe Mars as well. Uh, there was belief that Mars had canals on it, and, and the aliens were trying to get water from the poles to the equator. Maybe their world was dying and so on. But uh, well, now we know that Venus has a surface temperature of 900 degrees Fahrenheit, so you're not going to have any kind of life there at all. And those clouds, by the way, that permanently enshroud Venus are made of sulfuric acid type compounds. It has an atmospheric pressure that's 100 times that of Earth, crush it like a tin can. There's just lots of ways to die on Venus. It is not a place you want to visit on your next vacation. Uh, Mars is a little better in that Mars would, um, Mars would kill you slower, okay? <laughs> Uh, you can't breathe on Mars. It's got a poisonous carbon dioxide atmosphere that's very thin, so lack of pressure would be an issue. Uh, there's no liquid water on the surface, as far as we know. There's evidence it had water in the past, which is kind of interesting. But no, these, these planets are not, they're not right. And of course, the, the surface temperature of Mars, Venus, way too hot, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Mars is below freezing, so it would be rather uncomfortable. This is kind of like, um, it's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You got those two, they're too hot. That one, that's too cold. Earth's just right because it's at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amount of heat and light, and that did not happen by chance. Which raises the question of extraterrestrial life. And I don't believe we're going to find extraterrestrial life. Uh, secularists are kind of counting on that because they figure Earth's just another planet where life happened to evolve, and hey, it's a big universe. Chemistry's probably right somewhere else, statistically. Um, but they haven't found any, interesting. And I would say, wait a minute, God formed the earth to be inhabited. And I'll, I'll grant, the Bible doesn't say, and he didn't make any other planet to be inhabited. You've got to be careful about that. But it does seem like the earth is very special in God's plan. Again, three days older than any other planet. It's the planet where God created the creatures that, that bear his image. And um, so I would, ex I would not expect to find life out in space. And so far, the observations have been consistent with that. In fact, the secularists are a little puzzled. Where, why, don't we, why don't we see the aliens? 
We've been listening for alien signals from space for a long time now. We haven't heard any. Why is that? I'd suggest it's because they aren't there. But it, I do understand the need because, you see, we've been designed by God to be in communion and union with him, right? We're supposed to, we're relational creatures. God made us that way. We, under, we understand that there's this mind that's beyond us. And when people reject that God, that need comes out in other ways. Ask a secularist, why, why is it that you really want to find extraterrestrial life? Well, it'd be nice to not to be alone in the universe, and maybe they would have incredible technology that would be able to cure our diseases, and maybe they've even figured out how to live, live forever. Maybe they could give us eternal life. All the things that God, in fact, gives us, but when you reject God, that need comes out in other ways. So I'm going to suggest that's the reason why there's a lot of hype regarding extraterrestrial life, but I don't expect to find it so far. Uh, we've been right. And I think there's some theological issues you have to think through, too. If you've got Vulcans and Klingons out there, they can't be saved. Do you realize that? Because, it's remember, we're a relative of Christ. He came into the world. He became a human being, not a Klingon or Vulcan. And so he came into the world as one of us to pay for our sins on the cross. And he said, well, maybe Jesus went to the other, you know, di- went to Klingon and the Klingon homeworld and died for them. Because, no, the Bible says he died once for all. He's not going to have to die again. He's raised incorruptible. So, Lieutenant Worf is out of luck. Uh, he can't be saved. Uh, anyway, anyway, those are some of the issues you have to think through. And as much as I like science fiction, and I do, it's, it's fun. But I, the real universe isn't that way. The real universe is the biblical universe. What about distant starlight? I'm going to go through this. I'm just going to touch on this. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of depth because there are resources you can get that all. Um, give you a little more information on this. But this is the issue of, of these, the light from these galaxies. Galaxies are incredibly far away, and they really are. The universe is enormous, and light is very fast. It travels 186,000 miles in one second. could go around the Earth seven times in one second. That's how fast light is. And, but these galaxies are so far away that you'd think, given their distances, even light, as fast as it is, would take billions of years to get from there to here. And we do see these galaxies, so obviously the light has gone from there to here. Doesn't that prove the universe is billions of years old? And uh, the answer is no, of course. I have to tell you, though, that some of these solutions that people have proposed uh, really don't work. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail on this. I just have to do this. Otherwise, people will come out and say, have you thought of this? Yes, we've thought of that. That uh, doesn't work. There's a reason, okay? Um, some people have said, well, maybe the distances aren't real. That's not feasible. The, the, the method, the re- the, um, y- you should question what people state when they say, this has been scientifically demonstrated. You, you should ask how. You should. And if they give you a sensible answer, then you ought to accept it. Uh, if their answer is based on evolutionary assumptions, then you have the right to say, well, I'm not convinced then because your reasoning isn't good. But I have to tell you that the way in which these distances have been discovered does not depend on secular or evolutionary uh, assumptions. It's based on good math and logic and geometry and things like that. Uh, some people have said, well, maybe the speed of light was faster in the past. And that's a, that, was a good, that was a good idea to try. Because there are some times when evolutionists assume that rates are constant when in fact they're not. And they end up with inflated age estimates. Like I think, I think that's the answer for radiometric dating and why that we sometimes get wrong age estimates on rocks that we know are brand new. And then you, you get the age estimate and it gets millions of years, but we know it formed last year. You know? So we think that's probably the answer for some of those, for some of those. But we think the speed of light's not like that. The speed of light's very different from other speeds. And it, 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 it actually is related to other things in nature, like the relationship between energy and mass. You know, Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. The C in that equation is the speed of light. So, and E is energy and M is mass. So if you change the speed of light, the relationship between energy and mass would change. Atoms might not even be possible if you change the speed of light in a vacuum very much. So we think it's always been what it is today, and that's important for matter to exist. Some people have said the light was created already in transit, that when God made the stars, he made a light beam connecting them to the earth. And to be clear, God did make a mature universe in the sense that it was fully functional from the beginning. Nobody questions that if you're a biblical creationist. God made Adam as an adult, not as a baby. But this is a little different, though, because if God made the beams of light, then that also means he made pictures of things that never existed and, and events that have never happened. Because you see, we, think we see things happen in space. Like we saw a star blow up in 1987. There was a star in one of our nearby galaxies, the, um, one of the Magellanic Clouds. It's 168,000 light years away, which means in secular thinking, that star actually blew up 168,000 years ago, and the light, finally, the light from that explosion finally arrived in the year 1987. 
Okay, that's the secular view. If you say, no, the, the reason we're able to see it is because God made pictures of that explosion in a beam of light 6,000 light years out, and they finally arrived in 1987. That means that star that you see in the left panel never existed, and that explosion you see in the right panel never happened. And I, I take issue with that. And today it looks like this, by the way. Uh, you can see what's left of that star expanding out into space. I believe that's real. I believe that actually happened. Uh, does God have the power to make fictional images? Of course, that's not the issue. I think it's inconsistent with his nature to give us senses that are basically reliable and then, and then create uh, fictional movies. So I don't think that this is the best answer, and there are much better answers. Uh, Russ Humphreys pointed out that time dilation is a possibility, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but um, time dilation I is, the, is the fact that time t clocks can tick at different rates under different circumstances. It has nothing to do with the nature of the clock. It doesn't matter what the clock, how the clock works, time itself can be slowed under certain circumstances. And uh, Humphreys thought maybe the Earth has aged only 6,000 years, but the rest of the universe has aged more than that because of time dilation. Neat idea, but when I go through the math, I can't get it to work out, and neither has anyone else been able to get it to work out in a way that would get the light here. So I'm going to give you what I think the answer is. It's a little counterintuitive. But uh, God is under no obligation to make the universe intuitive. Take a class in quantum mechanics. You'll realize that God is very smart, and he doesn't always do things the way we expect. And you know what? The more you study science, that is just delightful. I like the fact that quantum mechanics is weird and counterintuitive. And, but we can study it, and we can learn, because we're learning something about the mind of God. Likewise, the speed of light is weird. For one thing, the speed of light is l unlike other speeds in that we cannot measure the speed of light in, in a single direction. And what I mean by that is, uh, effectively, any, any attempt to measure the speed of light is actually measuring what we might call a round-trip speed. It's like you take light, send it out, bounce it off a mirror, bring it back. You measure the total distance it had to travel, the total time. You divide, you get the answer. And the answer you get in vacuum is always 186,082 miles per second. Light can't be sped up or slowed down in vacuum, okay? So to do such an experiment, I could stand at one end of a, let, let's build a long hallway, 186,282 miles long. We'll pretend we have government funding. We can waste it that way. And uh, we'll put a mirror at the other end, okay? And I'm going to stand here with my flashlight, and when my clock strikes noon, I'm going to turn on the flashlight for just an instant. That light pulse is going to travel down the hallway, reflect off the mirror, and then as soon as I see the reflection, I'll look at the clock and see what, how much time has transpired. If we did that experiment, you'd see the reflection two seconds later. We tend to think of our reflection in a mirror as instantaneous. It's not quite. It's a little bit behind. Uh, it's just that the distance between you and the mirror is very short. But if the mirror were 186,000 miles away, the light has to travel there and back. So it's ha it has to travel twice that distance. It takes two seconds to do it, so you divide and you get 186,000 miles per second. That's why we did it that way. It makes the math easy, okay? Most people assume that the light traveled the same speed out as in, and therefore it took one second to get to the mirror and one second to get back, because why not? We don't actually know that, because it could be that the light took no time at all to get to the mirror and then took all of two seconds to get back for whatever reason. I'm not talking about what's the cause. We'll, we'll get to that later. I'm just pointing out that in both cases, if I'm standing where that flashlight is, in both cases, I see the reflection two seconds later, don't I? The light arrives at the same time. Or hypothetically, it could be that the light takes all of the two seconds to go out, and then it takes no time at all to zip back. Why would it be different? I don't know, but I don't know why it would have to be the same. We can't just assume something, because wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if the speed of light's the same in all directions? Yeah, but that doesn't make it so. How do I know? that this bottom scenario is not correct. What if light, when it's incoming, for whatever reason, just the structure of the universe or whatever, how do I know that light, when it's incoming, is infinitely fast, but when it's outgoing, it travels at, it would have to be half C, because the average has to be C. We know that. When you average it out, it'll, oh, it, the total trip takes two seconds. There's no getting around that. That's fixed by God. We can't change that. But the speed on one direction, we don't know. We don't know, and that's interesting, because if that bottom scenario is true, then there is no distant starlight issue, because the light doesn't have to go out to the galaxies, reflect, and come back. It just has to go one way. And if the speed of light is instantaneous toward an observer, then uh, there is no starlight problem. And so I'm kind of rooting for that bottom scenario, but that doesn't make it so. 
And so people have thought, well, we need to measure the one-way speed of light. And it turns out it's impossible to objectively do that, and I'm going to show you why. You might think, well, the way we'd measure the speed of light in one direction is I have a clock where I'm at, and then I have another clock over there. No mirror. We're going to throw that away because we just want to do one way. And when my clock strikes noon, I'm going to send out a light pulse. It's going to go over. It's going to intercept that other clock, and that's going to record the time when the light arrives. Okay? And I did the equivalent of this experiment in my office. I don't have the long hallway, but I have the distance between my watch and my phone, and I can convert, okay? So um, I, as soon as my watch struck noon, I turned on the flashlight, the light hit the phone, and I read the time on the phone as soon as it was illuminated. That tells me when the light hit. And it hit the phone, when, and the phone was reading 12.05. That's true. D would I then conclude, well, it must have taken five minutes for the light to get from my watch to the phone? Well, it, I mean, it seemed like it was instantaneous, but hey, it read 12.05, right? Now, in fact, that actually happened, but I didn't, I didn't draw that conclusion. I drew the conclusion that the clock on my phone is five minutes fast, right? You see, this method would only work if these clocks were synchronized, if they read the same time at the same time, okay? We understand that word from those old spy movies. Let's all synchronize our watches, right? And so they read the same time at the same time. Now... You can see why that would have to be, right? The clocks have to read the same time, otherwise you're not gonna get the right answer in terms of how long it took the light to get from one end to the other, right? And so you say, no problem, we'll make sure the clocks are synchronized. That turns out to be tricky. Uh, when you have two clocks that are separated by an enormous distance, synchronizing them exactly turns out to be tricky. And by the way, they have to be exactly synchronized. You can't say, well, it's close enough. Because if that clock is one second fast or slow, one second ahead of that clock or one second behind, it would make the difference between the speed of light being one half C and infinity. It's a huge difference, right? So those have to be exactly synchronized. And um, now I have uh, a clock in my apartment actually that receives a radio transmission from Fort Collins, Colorado. It's connected to the atomic clock in Boulder and it synchronizes itself. Uh, every night it synchronizes itself to the atomic clock and I'm a nerd so I think that's cool. Okay, I never have to set that clock. It even adjusts for daylight saving time. It's really neat. So radio transmission, that's how we'll synchronize these two clocks. When the clock strikes noon, we'll send out a radio pulse to the other clock, and it'll set itself to noon. But, that, but is it exactly synchronized? Radio is awfully fast, but it, actually takes a, it, might, it might actually take a little bit of time for that radio pulse to get from there to there. Now, I could compensate for that if I knew how long, right? If I knew the speed of radio, I could compensate. I could say, oh, okay, I know based on the distance that radio pulse took one second to get from there to there. So instead of setting that to noon, I'll set it to 120001, and they'll be synchronized, right? If I knew the speed of radio. Do you know the speed of radio? Anybody? It is. It's 186,000. It's the speed of light. It's the speed of light. But wait a minute. That's the very thing I'm trying to measure, right? I'm trying to measure the one-way speed of light. I can't assume that it's, um, it, th we know that radio and light travel at the same speed, we just don't know what that speed is. We know the round trip speed is 186,000 miles per second, but we don't know what the speed is on a one-way trip. Radio travels at the speed of light. That's the thing I'm trying to measure. See, I'd, already have, I'd have to already know in advance the one-way speed of light to synchronize clocks this way, so that I could then measure the one-way speed of light, but I've already assumed it. That's not gonna work. Some people have thought if you put the radio transmitter in between the two clocks, that would fix it because they'll, they'll both be behind the transmitter by a little bit, but at least they'll be synchronized to each other. But that assumes that the speed of light is the same that way as that way, and therefore the speed of radio is the same that way as it is that way. right? Because if, uh, uh, if it's not, then one clock will be get synchronized. That will be set to noon first, and that will be set to noon later. Doesn't work. Uh, the other trick people try to use is they'll say, well, we'll bring both clocks together and synchronize them. That's easy to do, because we can see they're, they're both right here. So there's no time delay. We'll synchronize them, and then we'll move them to opposite ends of the hallway. But there's a problem. Motion affects the passage of time. That's something that Einstein discovered. It's a small effect, but remember, if that clock is one second off from that one, it totally messes up the whole experiment. You get a completely wrong answer. Now, fortunately, Einstein discovered the formula by which clocks tick at different rates based on how fast they're moving. So we could, uh, we could calculate, we could say, okay, based on, you know, it's moving at this speed, so it should have gained or lost X amount of time, and so I'll make the adjustment. But in that equation, 
is the speed of light. You get the point? Even if, you, I, I, even if you're not, you know, if, if you get lost in the details, I hope that you understand the main point is this. It's apparently impossible to synchronize two clocks separated by a distance without already knowing the one-way speed of light. And it's impossible to measure the one-way speed of light with, without two clocks separated by distance that are synchronized. Each condition requires you to know the other one first, which means we will never know the one-way speed of light. Isn't that interesting? Just apologetics aside, that's just weird. It really is. There is a reason for it. And uh, apparently the one-way speed of light is actually a convention. A convention is something we choose and then we stick with it and it works like driving on the right side of the road. There's no law of nature that forces us to drive on the right side of the road. We all agree to that and that system works well. But then you go to Australia, they drive on the left side of the road. That works well for them because they all agree to that convention even though it's different. The one-way speed of light is something we get to pick within certain limits and then the return speed is determined by the condition that the round trip speed has to average to C, 186,000 miles per second. So it's kind of interesting. And it's, it's why this is called the conventionality thesis, if you'd like to look into this a little bit more. It's weird. It's something that's been discussed throughout the 20th century. Uh, Einstein was aware of this. Um, fi many physicists today, if they're, if they're no very knowledgeable of relativity, they would probably know about this. Folks who are not um, up on relativity might not. But it turns out that uh, if we define the speed of light to be instantaneous when it's moving toward me, taking no time at all, then that's called an anisotropic synchrony convention. Anisotropic means different in different directions. So light, when it's moving away from me, travels at half C. When it's moving toward me, it's instantaneous. When it's at right angles, it's C. It's the, a it's the average. Um, and you can do that. And, and that tells us that helps us to define what now means at a distance. I know that's a little bit weird, but again, no, but God was under no requirement to make physics intuitive. And some of it is and some of it isn't. That's just the way it is. And I believe the Bible is using this anisotropic synchrony convention because all ancient cultures did. And it eliminates the starlight issue. And there never has been a starlight issue because when God made the stars on day four, their light reached earth immediately because it's inbound uh, because God is using a, what, what we call day four out in space, we have to use a synchrony convention, and God would use the ancient convention, not one that wouldn't be invented until the 20th century, right? I mean, he knew it was coming, but he wanted, the Bible needs to, be, needs to communicate to all times and not just to uh, modern times. And I think there's good evidence in Scripture that God's using this anisotropic synchrony convention whereby we're seeing the universe in real time. And by the way, I'm not saying the other convention is wrong. This confuses people. I'm not saying it's wrong to say the speed of light's the same speed that way as it is in, I'm just saying that it's not a meaningful question. Um, we can define it to be different. We can define it to be half C out and, and infinite in, and that is allowable within the physics that Einstein discovered. So, and the Bible, I think, confirms this because it says in Genesis 1.14, then God said that there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. And we find out that's the sun, the moon, the stars also, right? And it says, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. So that was one of the purposes of these stars, is to give light on the earth. And it says, and it was so. What was so? He made the stars and they gave light on the earth. So apparently when God first created the stars, they immediately fulfilled their God-ordained rule of producing light and uh, that light arriving on earth immediately. And that suggests the Bible is using this ancient anisotropic synchrony convention, which we still use today. It's just considered less convenient than the alternative. So uh, most modern physicists will, will define the speed of light to be the same in all directions because it makes the math easier. But my point is you don't have to do it that way. The, uh, the ancient system works just as well. So if this is right, then there is no starlight issue. And nobody's been able to refute this. This has been out for over a decade now. And I published a paper on that, and no one's been able to refute it, so I think we got a pretty good model here. And I used that model to make the predictions about what the James Webb Space Telescope would see, and so far we've been spot on. Secularists were way off, so I think we do have a good answer to distant starlight. Uh, the, the book that covers much of what I talked about today is called Taking Back Astronomy, and this covers everything except the starlight issue, which is covered in my other book, The Physics of Einstein, which I think we sold out of, but you can backorder it. So, and in fact, if you, if you go ahead and, and buy it here, we'll ship it to you for free. So that'll save you a little bit of, little bit of money. And then if you want to find out how to locate these objects in the sky, these wonderful, beautiful things, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky. That's going to be the, the uh, book you want to get. So, very good. Thank you very much.